in Britain was characterised by the enormous growth both in the population and sheer physical size of its cities, such cities as London, Liverpool, Manchester and Birmingham. The increased numbers of people living closely together in urban conditions posed intolerable problems of public health. In fact, the very words Victorian city probably conjure up for you an image of overcrowded, ill-lit, underventilated buildings. Narrow, unpaved courts and alleys with all the squalor resulting from a lack of main drainage and inadequate water supply. In addition to public health problems, there was of course um, enormous urban mobility problems and transportation within the city became an issue, a very important engineering issue in the Victorian city. In this programme, we're going to look at some of these problems and the way in which technology really tackled them and solved them. It was in the Victorian city that massive engineering on a large scale, centrally planned and administered first became necessary. It was in the Victorian period that we see the emergence of the professional engineer dedicating his prof professional life to city, urban or municipal engineering. Tackling these problems, of course, requires the combined skills of a number of professionals. There were the lawyers, doctors, scientists, engineers and architects, but above all it required the will of the politician. By 1850 all the necessary engineering skills were available. What was needed was a central administrative body that could take an overview of London. It became quite clear that the small parishes and vestries were not equipped to do this, neither did they have the statutory powers. And it was then, in 1855, that central government stepped in and created, by an act of 1855, the Metropolitan Board of Works. At that time, the Thames here was virtually an open sewer, a problem which MPs certainly could not ignore, as the stench from the Thames was drawn in over the terrace of the Houses of Parliament and delivered through the floors of both the Commons and the Lords by the building's ventilation system. In fact, you could well say that the river was one of the most effective lobbyers of Parliament itself. The Thames is obviously important in study of the Victorian capital city. It was, of course, the main natural drainage channel for the valley. It was in itself an important transportation route and untreated Thames water in the middle of the century was being drawn from the Thames from London's oldest engineered waterworks from the arches of London Bridge. A wholesome supply of drinking water, of course, is one of the essentials of life. And in the development of the technology of, water, of the water supply industry, there are really three distinct areas of activity. First of all, there is the location of a source of water. This would involve the gauging of rivers and wells and the looking for springs and other sources of water. In London, the Thames supplies something like 70% of the population's water and wells and springs provide the remainder. The other element is that of treatment where filtration of the raw water is sometimes necessary before it is distributed to the customers or the user. And lastly, the one which developed principally in the Victorian period was the one of distribution. This requires a whole system of pumping stations, pumping technology, water mains and reservoirs as part of the system. Now to put the the achievements of the Victorians in context, it might be as well to remind ourselves briefly that water supply, the lifting of water for crops and irrigation, is possibly one of the oldest applications of man's ingenuity. Muscle power was used for centuries for hand-driven pumps and animal-driven pumps, and here in London the water supply system certainly made use of horse pumps. 
Water power, as we have already said, was one of the first applications of pumping technology when in the late 16th century, water wheels were placed underneath London Bridge. And by the 18th century, very sophisticated devices like this magnificent wheel of George Sorokold uh, was available in the 18th century. In the 18th century, Britain gave the world the atmospheric engine, and this was quickly seized on by waterworks engineers. At New River Head, in the 18th century, we see pictures of atmospheric engine houses, and alongside it, wind pumps. Uh, had, uh, wind energy had been used for pumping as well. And the base of the wind pump remains to this very day. In fact, a typical scene in the 18th century before James Watt engine appears is depicted here in this 18th century view of the Chelsea waterworks by the Thames. But it was in the second half of the 18th century that the Scottish engineer James Watt, in partnership with Matthew Bolton, produced the world's first proper working steam engine. And it was this rocking beam reciprocating pump engine which was typical of the Victorian, the early part of the Victorian waterworks practice. This engine here is a very good example. It was built by Bolton Watt at, in 1820 and started work in Chelsea in London. At the beginning of Victoria's reign, it was moved down here to the Grand Junction Water Company's works at Kew on the Thames. This engine has a, a steam cylinder, 64 inches diameter, with an eight feet stroke. And it can lift 130 gallons per stroke. The Bolton Watt engine was a very fine piece of engineering, but the Cornish mine engineers down in the West Country had produced a refinement on the working technique which made it even more efficient. And it was here in London that the Bolton Watt engine and the Cornish engine were put to trial and the Cornish engine won the competition, as it were, and really began to replace conventional Bolton Watt engines. This engine was converted to work on the Cornish principle in 1846 and 18, between 1846 and 1848. Now the Cornish principle is quite simple and is very economic on steam. What the steam does is merely to push the piston down on one side of the massive rocking beam and on the other side of the pivoted beam there is a very heavy counterweight and it is this weight and gravity that forces the plunger down which does the lifting work of the engine. And because the steam is only required to push the piston down through part of its stroke, it is an incredibly efficient device and became almost universal in waterworks practice. It was also necessary, of course, in waterworks practice to keep a very accurate record of the numbers of gallons of water pumped and this provided a useful comparison for the company accountants to compare their revenue from the sale of water to clients. In terms of engineering history, of course, Queen Victoria's 60 glorious years was a very long period indeed. And whereas the, for most of the period, this, these massive beam engines um, held the day, towards the end of Victoria's reign, the direct acting triple expansion engine began to supplant these magnificent engines. The average beam engine working in waterworks supplies develops about 100 horsepower. That is, it would do about the work of 100 horses in lifting water. The more compact device uh, was very popular in that it required far less architectural enclosure and the shape of waterworks buildings began to change. This triple expansion engine, which is preserved at the Living Steam Museum at Kew in West London, is a very good example of the compact triple expansion steam engine. This engine, running at a mere 40 revolutions per minute, could in fact lift a thousand gallons of water a minute to a height of 350 feet. It's a very good example of the turn of the century waterworks engineers' practice. Water supply in London developed quite separately from main drainage and developed through private enterprise. 
companies raising money on the capital market with shareholders and company meetings in the normal way. There were eight companies by the middle of the century and these remained right the way through to the end of Victorian period. They were the East London Company, the New River Company, the Southwark and Vauxhall Company, the Lambeth Company, West Middlesex, Grand Junction Company, the Kent and Chelsea Waterworks Companies. The statistics are really rather amazing. The population of London had more than doubled in Victoria's reign to nearly five and a half million people by the 1880s. This enormous population was each receiving from the waterworks companies 28 gallons of water per head per day. This required a water main system of something over 4,500 miles with 175 steam engines delivering a total of nearly 21,000 horsepower. There were 101 filter beds around the London scene each of about one acre in extent. The interesting thing is the public were quite interested and willing to pay these private companies directly for a supply of drinking water. They were much less keen to pay for main drainage. In fact, there was really very little commercial interest in a main drainage system. Effluent removal was something that they, in inverted commas, should do. Somebody else had to do it. Water supply and main drainage are related in two important ways. Firstly, the, the potential development of a water supply system is limited by the means of disposing of the water after you've used it. And more importantly, perhaps, the lack of a main drainage system led to the pollution of the water companies, ground and river water sources. And in 1849, Dr. John Snow, Queen Victoria's physician, published his famous book, which explained quite clearly that cholera was a water-transmitted disease. Polluted water produced horrific death and mortality tolls in the middle of the century. Once this had been established, of course, the need for a main drainage system in London was absolutely inescapable. Although water supply and main drainage systems are obviously interrelated, they remained under separate management throughout Victoria's reign. The supply of water is obviously limited to some extent by the means available for its disposal after use. And as we've seen, the water cycle is affected when ground and river sources become polluted. A drainage system has two main functions. First, is the efficient and effective removal of domestic and industrial effluent. And the second is to prevent flooding of streets and the waterlogging of land by surface water or storm water, as it's usually known. The need to do something about main drainage in London was triggered by epidemics of cholera. In 1832, for example, 7,000 people died when the population was only 1.6 million. And the disease usually kills about half those people who contract it. The worst epidemic occurred in 1849 when 14,600 people died uh, with a population or in a population of 2.2 million. The medical journal, The Lancet, described the situation perfectly in 1855 when it said, Wheresoever we go, whatsoever we eat or drink within the circle of London, we find tainted with the Thames. The abominations, the corruptions we pour into the Thames are not, as some falsely say, carried away into the sea. The sea rejects the loathsome tribute and heaves it back again with every flow. From 1847, the drainage problem in London was being studied by the Metropolitan Commissions of Sewers set up by central government. And by 1851, a decision had been taken that the best way of dealing with the problem was that of an interception system of drainage. In the Thames Valley in central London, the streams, rivers and ditches on the north side of the Thames flow south. And those on the south flow north and discharge into the Thames itself. 
The interception system involved a series of east-west trunk sewers which intercept the natural drainage channels before they reach the Thames. There were to be separate systems on the north and south sides of the river, each of which terminated in outfall sewers leading to remote sites in East London. In 1855, the Metropolitan Commissions of Sewers were replaced by the Metropolitan Board of Works, set up by central government. They immediately appointed Joseph William Bazalgette as their chief engineer. His job was to, first of all, gather data on which a drainage system could be based. This involved a population count, an estimated growth of population, estimated rainfall figures, and also the daily sewage flow in gallons per head. He had three assistant engineers to help in this work, and by 1865, when the work was in full flight, the office staff included six clerks, a drawing office of 19 draftsmen, and an outdoor supervisory staff of 84. Work began on site in January 1859. And very soon afterwards, the technical press of the day spoke of this gigantic undertaking, which is being pushed forward with the greatest vigour and activity at both sides of the Thames. They eventually were to describe it as this great national work. Work began on the south side of the river first, and Deptford pumping station, which you see behind me, was completed by 1865. From Deptford, the southern outfall sewer carries the sewage and stormwater to a reception station at Crossness. And here, the largest pumping station in the whole system was built. It was opened on the 4th of April by the Prince of Wales with great ceremony. And a contemporary writer describes the buildings. An ornamental group of brick buildings relieved by coloured bands and comprised beside the great engine and boiler houses pretty villas for the engine men and chief officers and about 20 neat cottages for the workmen with a large and handsome school which also serves for a chapel and lecture room. A lofty minaret-like chimney serves as the central feature of the group of buildings and is a conspicuous landmark from the river as well as across the marsh. The residences stand on a terrace-like embankment, beneath which is the great reservoir, six and a half acres in area. The Crossness site was in fact so remote that a schoolmaster was on the payroll of the pumping station. The engine house remains to this day with the four original Bolton and Watt engines which lifted sewage into the reservoir before discharge into the river, although they now remain cold and silent. Work on the north side of the Thames began with the construction of the mid-level sewer, the contract for which was let to Thomas Brassey, the very well-known Victorian railway contractor. This sewer is 12 miles long and runs from Kensal Green in West London to Old Ford in the east. It was built between 1859 and 1861 and was an extremely difficult civil engineering project involving tunnelling under buildings. The sewers on the north side of the river terminate at Abbey Mills pumping station which was built between 1865 and 1868. And unlike Crossness, it remains a working pumping station of London's main drainage. The structural ironwork and the boilers and the engines themselves were delivered to East London from Lancashire and assembled on site. The magnificent structural ironwork remains the principal feature of the building today. The main drainage of London incorporated a long cherished dream of the planners, that of embanking the River Thames. The Victoria embankment, which runs from Blackfriars to Westminster, 
is a major civil engineering work in itself, reclaiming much of the river. It was opened in May 1870 and was named the Victoria Embankment. On this embankment, there is a memorial to Joseph William Bazalgette, the engineer to the Metropolitan Board of Works. This embankment, like the main drainage system itself, is perhaps his best memorial. As an engineering work, it is of considerable interest in that it has an integrated services duct where water mains could be carried beneath the street. It contains the low-level sewer on its way to Abbey Mills pumping station in East London. And furthermore, includes a major contribution to the Victorian engineering of London's transport system. The movement of goods and people became a major problem in the crowded Victorian city centres and was an aspect of London life in which engineering and technology were to play an important role. Historically, the river was itself an important highway but became increasingly an obstacle to be crossed as the capital developed. Amongst the earliest river crossings were the ferries operated by generations of watermen, but these were progressively replaced by bridges. The river bridges of the early 19th century were of the traditional stone arch type, but as the century wore on, these tended to be replaced by structures of cast and wrought iron. Pedestrian and vehicle traffic increased considerably during the 19th century, and bridges had to be widened or replaced with new structures. And however effective as road bridges, they were nevertheless obstructions to river traffic. During the 19th century, the technology of underwater tunnelling developed considerably and was resorted to as a major alternative to surface routes. The notable prototype was Sir Mark Brunel's Thames Tunnel, built under the river between 1825 and 1843 from Rotherhithe to Wapping. But the characteristic technology which was to have such a dramatic effect on Victorian life and cities was that of the steam locomotive. Bringing the railway system into city centres involved massive demolition of buildings and the displacement of populations in its wake. At the beginning of Victoria's reign, in fact by 1838, London had three main railway termini. London Bridge, providing a route to the southeast, Euston, serving Robert Stevenson's London and Birmingham Railway, and Paddington, the London end of Isambard Brunel's Great Western Railway to Bristol. Soon afterwards, the Eastern Counties Railway had come into Shoreditch, and by 1848, the London and South Western Railway had its terminus at Waterloo. These termini lay on a great ring around the heart of the capital, and interstation, cross London journeys, had to be made in horse-drawn carriages, cabs, or by the public omnibus pioneered by George Shillibeer in 1829. In 1853, an underground railway was proposed, and in 1855, a parliamentary select committee recommended that the various London railway termini should be connected by a railway with each other, with the docks, the river, and the post office, so as to accelerate the mails and take all through traffic, not only of passengers, but in a still more important degree of goods off the streets. The Metropolitan Railway Company was formed and appointed John Fowler its engineer, with Benjamin Baker as his assistant. Difficult surveys were made, designs undertaken, specifications written and contracts let, and an army of navvies began work in the streets of London. Work began on the Metropolitan Railway in March 1860, from Paddington with a line 
three and three quarter miles long round to Farringdon in the city of London. This was opened in 1863 with great ceremony. The line was first operated by steam locomotives, indeed the only form of traction available to the engineers. This of course posed great ventilation problems in the tunnels and in the stations themselves. Work continued through the 1860s and 1870s and the great circle line connecting the termini moved south from Paddington and had reached Mansion House by 1871 with the route contained in the Victoria Embankment. The line from Farringdon in the city moved south and terminated in 1876 at Aldgate, leaving a gap which was not to be completed until the autumn of 1884 when the railway was christened the Inner Circle. However, at the end of Victoria's reign, the streets were still extremely crowded with horse-drawn traffic, as can be seen in this archive film. <coughs> Steam power had taken over for passenger traffic on the river boats of the Thames, and electric traction had been applied to the underground railway for the first time in the world. But in water supply and main drainage, steam was still supreme. As we have seen in this program, the expanding Victorian city made enormous demands on legislators, architects and engineers. New administrative structures had to be evolved and massive engineering works undertaken. The Victorians were not only proud of their splendid town halls, but the same attention to detail was lavished on their waterworks engines, sewage pumping stations and their railway structures. The legacy of buildings and machinery which we've inherited from the period tells us not only uh, how technology was applied to the solution of social problems in the 19th century, but also something of the artistic taste of the Victorians and, the, and their municipal aspirations. But above all, it was the Victorian period that showed us once and for all that life in a city is just not possible without bold conceptual engineering design massive feats of construction and the continuous dedicated attention day and night of plant engineers who will operate and maintain the buildings and the largely hidden machinery essential to the life of a city.